aka reverse long with this with the the friendly bear podcast and i have with me a special guest today um the wall street coach kim ann Curtin. uh she's the author of transforming wall street a conscious path for a new future which is on audio and text um she's also the co-host of the steady trade podcast and she has her own podcast as well uh the Wall Street Coach. Is that what it is, Kim? That's it. The Wall Street Coach. You got it. Great. Well, great to have you on, Kim. Finally, I get to meet you after being such a big fan of uh, all your stuff, you know? Well, so, yeah. Thank How you, are you for doing? being a fan. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for being a fan. Thanks for listening. And thanks for watching the Study Trade podcast. We have a lot of fun making them. So it's it's fun to meet the people that are listening to us. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I always like the perspective that you brought into the podcast, like uh, from a coach standpoint and like from a psychological and kind of like a different kind of voice than what we're used to as traders. Um, yeah. And uh, and to, to see the whole progress of the whole steady trade for like, I don't know, I've been listening like almost two years now. And wow. I'm pretty sure the first year I was just so overwhelmed with trading on my own. I didn't even have time sure. for it, but uh, I'm sure. starting to dig deeper into the older ones. I just I enjoy the vibe, you know, so it's a good vibe. We have, we have, you know, Tim Bowen and Steven Johnson are a lot of fun and smart and they both have very different perspectives. So, uh, and I, you know, I, we, I've been on there. It'll be my two year anniversary in uh, another month or so. So it's been two years. I don't know how years. that's possible. It's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, so how did you get in, involved with steady trade first? You know, I actually, I live in Hawaii now. I'm a former New Yorker and I am very good friends with Alan Cohen. He's a coach and a bit of a spiritual teacher. And I have a lot of respect for him. And he has a kind of a yearly or twice yearly retreat to here in Hawaii for coaches in training. And he had me come, has me come and speak to them about the business side of coaching. And, you know, I think a lot of people want to be coaches because they want to be a contribution to somebody else. But to do that in today's world, you have to be able to also make money. So he has me come in and speak about that. I did a talk for him. And uh, one of the girls who was participating, her boyfriend overheard me. And he at the time was working for Steady Trade and Stocks to Trade. And he told them about me. And he's like, hey, I think you got to have this girl on. So they had me on their podcast one time and then two times, then three times, 10 times later. They're like, okay, Kim, we think we want to hire you and bring you on. I was like, okay. So that's how it started. That's great. And um, I remember, I, I think in the in those podcasts, you went over how you got started in the whole Wall Street thing. Yes. But what I remember, it was like, in the, was it like during the 9-11? It was not 9-11, but New York's kind of second version of that, which was the 08 crisis. 08 so, crisis, okay. Yeah, the finance, you know, we basically were in the credit defaults, swaps, you know, the big short is the movie and the uh -huh. book by Michael Lewis that encapsulates what happened in 08. And uh, that is when I, I ultimately left a finance position where I was very well compensated to start my own coaching practice. And I just unfortunately started it in 2006, 2007. So right before this went down. And of course, you know, when people are in the middle of that kind of a harrowing situation, you don't want to spend any money, certainly not on coaching. So everybody stopped spending. And I, you know, had just left a Tony job. And I was like, oh, oh now what do I do if I'm not able to get clients? And uh, I was very involved in a free hugs movement that was kind of going viral at the time. I don't know if you remember that guy, Juan Man. He was doing free hugs all over the planet, the globe, and it kind of took off. So I did free hugs in New York City. And one day a friend said to me, you know, the free hugs movement, what if you did free coaching? Uh, and this was right after, um, you know, everybody was realizing, okay, we have a situation in finance, in Wall Street, the market was... I, so long story short, I sat outside the stock exchange, uh, New York Stock Exchange with a sign that said the coach is in, like Lucy from the Peanuts, you know, the doctor is in, uh -huh. I put the coach is in. 
And I just happened to sit there on October 7, 2008. And that was the day the market dropped significantly at the time, over 500, 600 points, which today it's not that big a deal because we've had a crazy market the last few years. But back then it was a big deal. And uh, people who are like let go of on the spot, floor traders, executives, bike messengers, secretaries all sat down on the bench with me. And a reporter saw this happening and wrote an article about me and called me the Wall Street coach. And once I heard that name, I went to GoDaddy.com and I was like, does anybody have that name? I was like, that is a brand, man. So my focus wasn't specifically, I didn't come up with the Wall Street coach, kind of, it kind of came to me. So uh -huh. wow. I ran with it. I ran with it. Now I have it trademarked. So, so wow, that's great. Um, Great. So, so, okay. So you went from that to, uh, sticking around wall street and then to Hawaii. Yeah, I was, I was a New Yorker. So I was just, you know, living in the city. I actually decided to coach, uh, for one year. So what I did is I just considered it as a volunteer gig. I'm still, I still was working with clients. I still had paying clients. And after the initial part of the OA crisis, people started to, you know, go back to normal. It took a while, but I just considered that a volunteer shift. So I just go down weekly for a couple of hours at lunchtime and coach uh, outside the stock exchange for free to those who were in the middle of that transition. They were, you know, struggling to get a new job, uh, trying to tell one. I remember one trader, he hadn't even told his wife he had been let go of because he was so demoralized by it. Uh, so it was, you know, just my way of giving back. And then I started to get more corporate clients uh, to do the executive coaching with. Uh, and so that, you know, went on for a number of years, uh, the coaching itself. And then I got an opportunity to come to Hawaii to house it. And I wanted to write my book, Transforming Wall Street. Uh -huh. And uh, so I came here initially just to house it for a nice chunk of time. And I found myself just falling in love with it. So I moved here full time five years ago. Five years ago. So, okay. So how did the book come about? What were your intentions of writing this book? Like, how did you approach that? I think uh, because of my being so intimately connected to Wall Streeters now for 25 years, you know, that I worked on Wall Street for 10 years before I became a coach and I knew really good people. I worked for really good people. I worked for two hedge funds. I worked for a bank trade association. I have been fortunate to be exposed to the salt of the earth, a lot of really great human beings who had a lot of integrity. So I think it was a combination of my uh, frustration with all the bad guys getting publicity, you know, the Bernie Madoff, who was totally corrupt and a fraud. He took the covers of the paper for a while. The OA crisis, obviously Wall Street made a lot of in incredibly big mistakes in that period of time. But I also thought, why don't we ever hear from the men and women who have succeeded with integrity to let them be the lighthouse shining the way forward. Plus I'm a reader, I read a lot. And I had read uh, Adam Smith, theory of moral sentiments, which is the umbrella actually that the wealth of nations sits in. And if you don't know who Adam Smith is, he is kind of known as the godfather, if you will, the father of capitalism. Uh, his book, The Wealth of Nations was written, you know, back uh, quite some time ago. And in his theory of moral sentiments, he talks about mankind, uh, you know, he talks about the wealth of nations, but what he says is that wealth of nations can, actually only be measured by how those with the least amount are taken care of by those who have the wealth. So he feels we have a moral obligation to our brother. So I, I think I'm an advocate of conscious capitalism. I was an advocate of what I felt Adam Smith stood for. And I just wanted to talk to those who perhaps were like-minded and let them have a spotlight for once. So I found 50 Wall Streeters that I felt had succeeded in their industry, in the industry with integrity, with consciousness, because, you know, I'm a coach. I'm all about like in trying to be, improve my own consciousness and those of my clients. The more awake you are, the more aware you are, the potential for greatness, right? But if you're half asleep, unconscious, doing things by default, you know, how far can you go? So I thought, okay, if I found men and women who had succeeded with integrity 
in the finance world, it would be it would be nice to hear them tell us what we need to do by way of transforming Wall Street so that it doesn't have an OA crisis or collapse again. And so that's the long answer to how the book came about. And one last thing is I saw a Toni Morrison quote in the Strand Bookstore in Union Square. I walked by one day while I was thinking about the idea and it said, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And so wow. it felt like, oof, that was yeah. a mandate from above when I saw that. It was quote. a calling right there. Yeah. Oh, felt like a calling. So with the Wall Street 50, that was something. So you came up with that and then you sought out those 50. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Um, yeah, I remember uh, you, you go over like Bill Ackman was one of the yes, the, yes. Uh, the last ones, I think a few last few chapters. I remember Bill Ackman was a big one in there. Um, yeah. And then you, you mentioned also about like society focus on the like the bad stuff, like uh, Jordan Belfort gets a lot of attention. But then the, the good stuff, the guys that actually held their values and denied a lot of those negative uh, exactly. possibilities, they don't get any, any, any they don't publicity, get any recognition. And, you know, just, just alone, if you think about like, I'm, I have the book here, so I'm just going to grab it. But, you know, there's this, we all knew Bernie Madoff's name, but we never, ever talked about Frank Casey. Frank Casey spent 11 years with Harry Markopoulos and Neil Cello begging every uh, organization from the feds up in Boston down to New York to, to take note of what Bernie Madoff was doing. They sussed it out early. Uh, Harry Markopoulos was con is considered a forensic accountant. And when actually Frank Casey, who's one of the men featured in my book, uh, asked, you know, he, he was like, wow, Madoff's accounts only go up. How is that happening? We should try to figure it out and we could duplicate our own fund based on this. And Neil Cello and Harry Markopoulos, when they came together, Markopoulos like took one look at like his, uh, you know, letters of what his accounts were doing. And he was like, this is a fraud. And Craig Casey was like, this guy can't be a fraud. Like governments are invested in this account. This guy is the smartest man in the room. Everybody's invested with him. And Markopoulos was like, I'm sorry, this guy's, nobody goes up all the time. Gravity, you know, like you can't yeah. go up all the time. And they, they couldn't get the government to even listen. So Madoff really went on for another 10 years longer than he should have. And everybody knows Madoff's name, but I'm like, why don't they know Maid, you know, uh, Frank Casey's name and these other gentlemen who went to, they, they risked their lives. I mean, this was billions of dollars that were at stake here in Madoff's organization and the people that were invested in it were very powerful people. And yet nobody ever gives them any credence. And I'm like, they risked their lives to expose that fraud so huh. more people wouldn't be played. And yet nobody talks about those guys, you know? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a shame because uh, if we were to change the culture and transform Wall Street to bring those, you know, good character and good values up, then um, maybe uh, there would be a whole different um, way we look at things. But even That's like as, as traders, um, we tend to, I know for, uh, I think I speak for a lot of traders, is that mm -hmm. we tend to like weigh the the negative outcome more than the positive one you know if a, a, a loss yeah. hurts more than you know yes than yes, the sure. feeling of a win for sure you know? and so. that's psychologically physiologically the way we're built and i'm so glad you brought that up because thank god for that because that quality is why we are still here we would not have been able to be at the top of the food chain if we weren't hyper hyper sensitive and vigilant to our environment when we were running around on the serengeti trying to escape a saber-toothed tiger like thank god we have this aversion you know to uh loss right however if you are unconscious to the way your physiology works then you are going to be on its leash. And what I say to people is you have to understand that the body has developed over thousands of years 
treating is relatively new. The ability for your mental capacity to handle and navigate all of this is relatively a new development. So you got to put in reinforcements or a prenup, so to speak, to prepare yourself for the inevitable. Like the fact that, you know, when we lose, it hurts three times more than when we win. Prepare for that so that it doesn't throw you a curveball. Gotcha. Absolutely. Um, I will take heed to that. And I, I'm glad I got this on recording. I'm going to listen to that a few times. Um, okay, good. <laughs> all right. So let's see what, what drives you to talk about capitalism and how it helps to drive society in the right direction. Uh, I mean, capitalism when it's done with integrity, uh, I think is magic. I mean, it's just magic that, you know, something that I might create and produce could be a contribution to somebody else that they would pay for it. And, and then it, it to me seems like a, a, a very unlimited circle. And, you know, one of the other people I interviewed in my book, Michael Porter, he's uh, one of the world's experts on competition. And he is a professor at Harvard Business School. And he has this great article that was in Harvard Business Review that talked about he he himself, he's at Harvard Business School, so clearly he's considered himself a capitalist, but he was looking at, you know, how to be more strategic for nonprofits. And he was trying to look at their model. And he was thinking, okay, if I'm the world's expert on how to be, you know, more strategic and more competitive, what do they need to do? And he realized the most effective thing a nonprofit could do is become a for-profit company because then the, the, the place that there's waste or not uh, accurate work being done, it would all slough to the wayside. And he said in that moment, he realized, wow, I thought I was a capitalist, but I, uh, he became what he calls himself a born again capitalist because he began to realize that the most powerful force in the world is when, because there's freedom involved in that, right? There's freedom involved in creating something for product putting your price on it because of the work or effort it took for you, and then having somebody say, hey, I want that product. Uh, so I, I think there's so much power in it. The place where I, I think it gets distorted is, and this, and this just happened only 35 years ago, is when we gave Hum when we gave corporations the same rights as human beings. That's when things start to go off the rails. And also when we gave, sh when we allowed, M Milton Friedman made a big mistake back in the seventies. I learned this from Pro Professor Lynn Stout. She wrote a book called The Myth of Shareholder Value. And ultimately 30 years ago, the shareholders became appointed as the most important person in the process. And they legally actually, and morally are not the most important person in the process of companies. And that has also kind of really taken capitalism down a dark alley. And we didn't have this happening before 30 years ago. We didn't have Enron's, Enron's happening because companies knew if we're not good to our own people and to the community, we won't stay afloat. But they started to just be worried about maximizing shareholder value. That became their whole focus and they stopped concerning themselves about the environment and about their people and about the community that they work and build a company in. And all that has kind of distorted capitalism and makes a lot of young people who may be listening to us here think capitalism is somehow dirty. And I guess I just want to say to them, when it's really pure uh, and working with integrity, it's not dirty. It's really powerful. But we have had a lot of people who's you know, motives have been not so great, taking advantage of the mistakes made along the way. Um, you know, I think it, one of the parts in your book, I think it was in your book, um, where the Occupy Wall Street movement was happening. I, and yep. Uh, yep. you mentioned like Peter Schiff, I think, was yep. that in your book? He goes yep. outside Peter and tries, to, tries yep. to explain uh, crony capitalism. Yep, exactly. And he's, and he's getting like tomatoes thrown at him. People don't yeah. want to... it, it, you know, verbal tomatoes, not, verbal not tomatoes. literal yeah, tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I put the, that in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. But he was definitely, you know, he was trying to explain what I what I saw, and that was also part of what informed why I wanted to write the book was because I had spent a year outside the stock exchange coaching people 
when Occupy, so Occupy Wall Street came about a year after the 08 crisis in response to that, because one of the things that came out about the 08 crisis, and if you ever saw the movie, The Big Short or read the book, you can see that the banks were absolutely selling crap to their own client. Not all the banks, but some of the banks, some of the bigger players. They basically were taking these very bad mortgages, chopping them up and putting them as though they were top grade investments. And then they sold that to their own clients. And when you know the housing crisis began, everything started to crumble down. And so ultimately what happened is the very uh, clients of these banks were were screwed. They were sold crap, basically, thinking it was a good investment. So Occupy's initial response was, hey, you guys can't get away with this. And then the, the horror was that we bailed them out. The government, the United States, bailed these banks out. These guys made their own trouble, and then they got bailed out. And I can understand the arguments about why we had to bail them out. But in my opinion, that's not capitalism, people. That's called corruption. That's called somebody fucks up, excuse my French, and then you give them money to say, it's okay, we'll let it go. Like Those guys are going to go do it again if they get off the hook that quick. There was nobody held accountable. So I got the essence of Occupy's motive. They were angry that there was no uh, accountability being taken around these banks for selling their own clients' crap. But the thing about Occupy that I was frustrated by was that I felt they were advocating socialism. And I felt that these young people didn't actually know what socialism was. Occupy came not long after the Arab Spring, where you had a lot of students protesting, uh, you know, in the Middle East, but this was like, they were starving. Like this was like this, and these people in, in Occupy Wall Street, like, you know, these kids have, you know, thousand dollar iPads and they have free pizza being sent to them. You know, these kids were not starving and they were advocating socialism. And I was kind of like, okay, I think you guys are a little mixed up. You need to understand what actual capitalism is. And what we just saw happen on Wall Street, that isn't even capitalism. That is total crony capitalism. That is not the same thing. So, so if you want to be mad at something, be mad at the corruption, not capitalism. It's like, it's not capitalism fault that people are taking advantage of these rules and screwing people over. So that's why I, I also wrote the book because I thought, you know, I could see they didn't understand what capitalism actually was about. And I felt like, you know, if I did the research and put it in kind of layman's terms, then maybe they would understand that it wasn't capitalism was the issue, but the corruption and the twisting of the rules and laws over the last 30 years, that was the issue. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it goes back to like highlighting the values, the value system, you know, like you were mentioning before, like instead of highlighting the negative, we highlight the positive and like stop giving the negative such limelight, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's like the sure. Jordan, like why are we as a society um, putting Jordan Belfort on the big screen doing cocaine and quaaludes and making it with the Lamborghini Correct. and, and uh, like, um, like immortalizing him as like the Wall Correct. Street guy, you know, like that's every, right. I remember um, when you when you're talking about the Occupy Wall Street movement, this is um, what year was this? It was 2009. 2009. Yeah. So I had just finished um, undergrad at that time and I was in limbo to go to graduate school for architecture at UCLA wow. and I, I got accepted and um, I'm surrounded with these really smart people at UCLA, the 15 out of like a thousand people applied. And they were for the most part, like for the Occupy Wall Street. So I was kind of like, I didn't really, I was just unaware of every, everything, yep. but like, these are really smart people. They're, they're not, but they're still not educated of, of uh, what we're talking about here, crony capitalism Correct. versus real capitalism. They're just seeing the negative because it's being pumped on the news. I say pumped things, <laughs> I trade stocks, but uh, it's being on yeah. the news. But it is pumped, and it is pumped. It, yeah. It, oh, and, and, they because that gets people, you know, when, when you get, look, I am all about civil disobedience. I am such an advocate for that. And you, we have to educate ourselves. And I think it's just so easy to just fall in line with like whatever the meme is of the day. And, you know, when I started to talk, cause I, you know, because I spent a year on a bench outside the 
stock exchange. I knew the cops on the beat. You know, I knew the crazy lady who always haunted that corner. Like you start to know the people of the neighborhood. So the Occupy Wall Street movement was happening just a couple of blocks from there. So I was like, okay, let's see what this is about. Right. So I remember walking through there and having conversations with young people. And I could hear that they, when they talked about we have to shut these guys down. And you even see a little hint of that now on not even a little hint, a big hint of it on the Reddit Wall Street bets. Oh, yeah, of right? course. Yeah. We're holding on. We're going to give it to the man. Like, like, there's just a disconnect that like, okay, you're going to give it to the man on your $3,000 Mac computer. You are the man, honey. You are the man. You don't own a $3,000 Mac computer unless you are part of the system. Like you, people have a tendency to otherize, like, oh, it's them over there. Well, where are you investing your money? Are you supporting uh, places that uh, really are corrupt because you're getting a good return? Well, you can't call somebody at the top of the Wall Street ladder corrupt if you're if you're doing that, you know, like people have a tendency to always want to find a scapegoat. And I'm just saying, you know, when you have one finger pointing out, you got five points back at you. So maybe look at your own choices before you start, you know, throwing, throwing the, the judgments out there, you know? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, these days we have the whole socialism thing uh, getting popularized and like, there's a whole, you know, counterculture for it. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I wish there was more stuff out there that describes capitalism for what it really truly is. And in, in, in like, and how the success of basically America was built on this, you know, and, yes, and uh, yes. I don't, both it of my was. parents were our immigrants. My father's from Iran and my mom is wow. from Cuba. Cuba's wow. going through a whole thing right now. So like, and I, I was born here and, and like, I'm just so grateful. Uh, yeah. To, from hearing all the stories and all that to have the opportunity to have freedom and capitalism yes. and and to yes. do do what you want have the opportunity and uh yeah you know i, I think it gets lost with all it the does. socialism and with the crony capitalism you know just because the crony capitalism for sure because it because it mixes people up and they they collapse that you know again we have serious problems right now in our corporate companies the the abuse i mean I have to be honest, I'm not thrilled that, you know, Bezos says thank you to all his uh, employees, but doesn't pay them, you know, a really a decent wage uh -huh. like that frustrate that to me does not feel like capitalism for for him to not be responsible for taxes for and it's not him it's companies like him, they they are taking advantage of uh that is to me not capitalism. Capitalism is you pay your employees a decent wage. Dan Price, he's somebody I'm a huge admirer of. He has a company called Gravity Payments. They process payments for entrepreneurs. And during uh, this was like more than three or five years ago, he decided he was going to bring every employee, regardless of their position, up to a minimum of the living, a living wage to take them out of poverty, which is $70,000 a year. And everybody told him it couldn't be done. Everybody said, you're going to go bankrupt. His business increased so dramatically. Can you imagine you're like making minimum wage at a company or a little bit above minimum wage? And your boss says, I'm raising everybody to $70,000. Do you know what kind of work ethic you're going to get out of those people and his growth because he's because he's not he's not taking all the money he's making and spending it on himself. He's saying, I want to take care of my people. He's making his profit, but what kind of a profit like that is what's kind of gotten out of control. But I think that's because of what happened with the prominence on shareholder returns. And Lynn Stout talks about that in her book. And I interview her in my book too. That was down one of the most important books that I read in my research was the myth of shareholder value. And that really only happened back in like 1975, 77. So there are issues with right now, the way capitalism is run in our country because the lobbyists have changed the rules to benefit the corporation. I don't think a corporation should have the rights of a human being. That seems screwed up fundamentally to me. But capitalism isn't at fault for that. It's 
people in academia who maybe thought they were smarter than they were, who made these mistakes and came forward with these suggestions that were incorrect, but you can't get mad about capitalism. It's like, you know, if, if you, if you trip over the cat, you know, maybe it's cause you're, you weren't paying attention to where you were walking. You don't kick the cat. <laughs> you realize, uh-huh. Oh, I should open my eyes a little, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. So, all right. Now going back to the trading, as far as like with, with coaching, um, yeah. So what, what is it uh, that drove you from also from the topic of like conscious capitalism to also being focusing on like the micro, you know, which is the, the trader, the individual trader yeah. or, the, or a group of traders? Yeah, well, I mean, I've been coaching for 14 years now. So, uh, you know, the coaching started a little before the Occupy Wall Street. You know, when I when I went and sat on the bench down at Wall Street, I was already a year and a half into my business. So I've been coaching for now 14 years. And I have always coached uh, finance professionals. I coach industries outside of finance, but the traders, most of the traders that I've worked with over the years were institutional traders. They were the traders at hedge funds, uh, but because, uh, and, and I had some day traders along the way, but they obviously exponentially increased after joining the Steady Trade podcast, because that audience primarily is day traders. So I would say more than you know, in the past 14 years, we've been in business, we have now a lot more uh, day traders coming in for coaching than we did before, because, you know, I guess they get to know me on the the podcast, and maybe they like what they see, and they think, okay, this girl has some philosophy that could help me be better at my trading game. So hopefully Uh that's why they come in. I could definitely see that. Um, I could see why a lot of, I think today you had a coaching session too in the, in the morning. I, uh, I, I got an email for it. You, you got an email for, well, I do, I do like an Instagram, uh, inst- one. Instagram live. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, do yeah. Instagram live Tuesdays and Thursdays, 4 30 PM Eastern time where I, I do speed coaching. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah, probably yeah. yesterday. So I do speed coaching on my Instagram live, you know, just to try to be again, a contribution back to people. There are Coaching is not inexpensive. It's a big investment and not everybody can afford it. So that allows me to try to still, you know, go back and be that contribution to those who maybe can't invest in it yet. And uh, Lucas is uh, my co-host on my podcast and he is also a trader and a coach. So he'll, you know, substitute for me if I can't be there. But, you know, we, we coach them we coach traders privately. They hire us, me and my team to work with them. And, uh, you know, when I go on Instagram live, it's just me trying to give back, give some advice to traders and then do some ex- quick speed coaching for people to see what it's like to um, have coaching. Gotcha. Um, now, as far as the, the how you got started with the from with the group. OK, so is it like the show? Because like I'm familiar with the show Billions. Is that like sure. what was your, is that what your role was? Yes, much with, it is. Uh, it's yes, it's executive coaching. And, you know, I think part of what's great about that show and what people have gotten to see with the dynamic between the character Wendy and Axe, her CEO, is, you know, he he's the character is portrayed as a very smart baller, right? This guy is he's got it going on. He is a brilliant genius and he is very strategic. And yet he can't see how he stops himself sometimes. And what I think is great about the way they wrote that show is they're letting, you know, I think for men, especially, it's really hard to allow themselves to look like they have any weakness, right? The culture is so toxic against men, forcing men to deny any vulnerability that it paints men into a corner in my experience. And it doesn't allow men to feel comfortable with their humanity or with, you know, places where they may have self-doubt. And I think that show luckily allows men to see, here's a guy who's definitely confident and yet he's self-aware enough to know that he can't see himself clearly by himself. And that's why he has a trusted advisor to be there to tell him the hard truths, right? She cares about him. She wants to see him succeed, right? And yet she has to tell him sometimes you're in your own way. I think we all need that. I don't know that we can do that for ourselves. Uh, So I think a coach is valuable, especially in trading, but in life. 
because we can't all see ourselves for the forest, for the trees. You know, we need somebody outside, but you have to be careful. Like you, you can't just have anybody give you that input. So be selective about who that person is. But the people that are willing to tell you the hard truths, they're the ones who probably really care about you, you know, because they want you to do better and go to the next level. So I love that the way that character is written, both of them. Uh, you know, it goes down the path, of course, of sex and all that good stuff because that's television. But there's still a really great message there of like, hey, it's okay to be very successful and have a coach because if anything, you're going to become even more successful, not just externally, but internally. You know, I've worked with billionaires who are not happy because the trappings outside is not what brings you happiness or peace of mind. It's going to be the internal. And I think for some people at the beginning of the trading journey, they don't get that. They think, oh, the money will solve it all. But you know what? You get to the other side of it and you realize, huh, it doesn't solve it all. It definitely makes life easier in certain ways, but there are challenges that come with it too. And that peace of mind is elusive. It has to be found within. So that's what I think mostly, if you have a good coach, hopefully that's what they're going to do with you, for you. Wow. Um, awesome. And what drives you to, to help people get like the best, ver become the best version of themselves as far as, you know, improving, psych you know, with their psychological game and mentality? Yeah. I think just what I've seen happen for my own life, you know, I've, done the work on myself. I've worked with a lot of coaches. I've hired, uh, I've worked with shamans. I asked for a therapist when I was 10 years old. Like I've been, I had a challenging childhood and I had a lot of limiting beliefs because of it. And I really could see that they were holding me back. So the more work that I did on myself, the more tools I acquired, uh, the feeling of like, wow, I've been through such a harrowing journey on so many levels and I've collected these tools. It seems criminal to keep those tools to myself. Like, why, why would I do that? Like, hey guys, if you use these tools, you get to open up doors where there, you didn't even know there were doors. You know, I, it just feels like, okay, I've gotten these tools. I have to be sure to share them with as many people as possible. So I think that's what motivates me. Absolutely. Um, and what's your favorite part about being in the training community in your niche? Uh, I think the support that traders have for other traders, you know, I'm not saying there isn't some jealousy, uh, but I, I've seen and heard and been witness to other traders who have been to hell and back having the backs of their traders. And it's inspiring. Wow. Okay. And, um, Okay, so you got involved with trading. Have you have you done trading? Yeah, I know I steady done, trade. I've done a little bit of trading, but not a lot. <laughs> now, I, I think I remember one episode where you say I think you bought a Bitcoin related stock. Yep, it was a sympathy play. Oh, Mara, uh, I think was it yeah. Mara? It was Mara. It was Mara. Yeah, Good yeah, memory. I, remember, I, remember I was that. like, oh, yeah. oh, I don't know if I'm gonna remember. Yeah, it was Mara. It so, was yeah, a think... Mara, and it was over a long weekend, and it went up twenty percent. And, uh, you know, Bryce Davis, who's one of the trainers there at Stocks of Trade, you know, he was walking me through it. And I was like, oh, I mean, buddy, I want to stay. I want to stay. You know, and he was like, let's think about this, Kim. And then I was like, oh, my God, I have the green eyed monster taking me over. Yeah, I have yeah, to get yeah. out. I have to get out. Yeah, so you're out of control. I was like, I was like, I'm out of control with the stupid 20%. So, but I shut it down. I shut it down right away. And the other thing too, is I really went into a thinking, I'm going to lose this money, which I think a lot of new traders go in thinking, how much can I make? I don't yeah. hear many of them say, how much can I lose? And I think that is one of my strong, you know, strong uh, strengths is that I would probably err on the side of what could I lose? So yeah. I do, you, do you remember the catalyst the or anything? Uh, the cat, well, the catalyst was the Bitcoin was going to go above, was it 50? I think okay. it, was, it was the Bitcoin was going to go up. And so that there was a collection of uh, ones that were going to just go up in sympathy to that. Okay. So you, you got to, you, you know, what you did. Okay. So uh, what's, what's next? I, uh, how, did you make, make any more trades? No. No, that's, that was your first. You succeeded and, and <laughs> you got to, you got to do another I one. I was like, I was like, I I'm going to quit while I'm ahead though. No, 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 I'm going to, I I'm going to, I just uh, really, we've been so busy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a company and I have a team of people. So it takes 
a lot of time to do that. But uh-huh. I do, I have a couple of people coming on the team now who hopefully will open up some space for me to get back into trading because I am very fascinated by it. And I'm, you know, definitely curious if my emotional intelligence background will give me, you know, the ability to do it. So, well, yeah, you, you know, um, like Tim Sykes says, you know, he uses like Steven Johnson as a real example. If he can do it, anybody could do it. You know, so <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, yeah. But Steven yeah. has been in it for, you know, he's so dedicated and disciplined. Uh, no, he, I seen that. I seen the improvement because well, I, I followed yeah. his journey from the beginning and he used to be. I mean, we're all undisciplined, but he used to be super yeah. undisciplined. Yeah. And I think like yeah. drinking while trading and everything. And, and then now <laughs> If it's like night and day almost if like yeah, because i took yes. like a like a two-year hiatus at one point okay. like a few, few years ago yeah and so i and i hadn't listened to steven like in two years and then i was wow. like whoa is this the same guy yeah yeah and it, it was it was a complete the growth the growth yeah, a, yes. a real growth a real growth yeah. and um i think he even had recently well months ago uh he had a, a session on youtube I, I enjoyed a lot i don't know if you saw it the conscious trading session yes, he had with yes. his buddy in dubai yes yes i don't know if you it saw really, it i did see it it was very powerful yeah, yeah, yeah sure. you know it's, it's kind of along maybe you influenced him for, to, uh, for that because it's talking oh. about conscious trading yeah you know so yeah, yeah. it was really you cool know, it's, it's it's i think it's important no matter what you do whether you're a trader whether you're living just you know your life and you know an investor you know you if you're not conscious if you're not awake uh you're you're not going to have the full experience you know you've got to uh-huh. be conscious it takes work because it's easy to be lulled into sort of a you know quasi alive state you know we have a lot of we have social media pouring down on us we have websites we have games we have you know so many ways to get distracted from being conscious and still and uh i think it's it takes a little more effort than ever before uh, to really work at being conscious and awake. And so, you know, look at the matrix, right? That's the best movie, how they show you like how everybody's walking through life kind of by default and how hard it is for Neo to come to awakeness to, you know, he has the choice. You can go down the, stay asleep, take this pill. You want to wake up, you take this pill, right? So you have to ask yourself, I think every day, do I want to be awake or do I want to be comfortable? And I don't know that a week is always going to be comfortable. I see. And, um, and I, 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 so the way I'm relating to that is, uh, it's like the way you're explaining with your book is like being aware of not being like, we're, we're, we're like force fed a lot of information these days to kind of yes. just like take the other side. Okay. The, when people were talking about like socialism, 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 capitalism yes. is bad, you know, t- take a, get the other point of view think for yourself, kind of digest it and and then come up with your own, uh, correct viewpoints on it. And as well as, as with trading and and with, with trading, when we're going through a trade, you have to be aware of your feelings about, am I being like, you know, overly greedy right now? Am I being overly like what's going on? Yeah. Am I, am I overly frightened? Am I coming from scarcity? Am I coming from a place of, I, I didn't earn it. I'm not worthy. Like, you know, there are some traders too, who can have success at a particular point in their journey and then start to lose because they self-sabotage unconsciously because they might feel like they, who are, who are they to have success? Right. Or there are those who feel like I'm always a loser, the Charlie Brown syndrome, I'll always be a loser and they're never going to win because they see themselves as not being enough in the first place. Like all of these unconscious biases are running you. And if you don't know about them, they run you right off a cliff. Wow. You know, so last year I was going through a streak, a good streak, and uh, everything seemed to be clicking. And then towards the end of that streak, I think uh, I felt like I wasn't worthy of uh, what what I've accomplished. (laughs) Wow. and then Did I you started start to lose. Yeah. And then I was like, wait a second. And last year was a good year for a lot of traders, including, you know, I was including me and uh, I was like, man, okay. So I just, I took a break. I took a month and a half break and kind of reset good everything. Job. Good yeah, job. I, actually, I actually traveled. I went to South America and, well and uh, done. yeah. Well and, done. and I came back with a clear mind and, and was, and it, you know, it then continued further, but I caught myself. 
That's um, so powerful. I'm so happy you did catch yourself because that is everything. You know, that is you being conscious, you being awake. Oh, I seem to be self-sabotaging right now. And I'm actually starting to feel like I'm not worthy of this success. Whoa, I better pause and take a look at that and get my head into a new place. That is everything, man. So well done, David. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, you know, so I, I keep that as an example. I mean, now, you know, I'm kind of, as I'm talking to you, reading your books and reading your audio books, I'm kind of like improving on that. Yeah. And also I'm, t I'm going to, I'm starting to take apart on like meditation and all that. So hopefully I, I improve in that aspect, but I do have it in the back of my mind to take time off in case I ever get in a situation like that. That's you know? great. So and maybe if it's okay to, you know, put my coaching hat on, I would say, do some work around your relationship to money, do some work around your relationship to success, because you probably have like a temperature gauge of what success looks like what's acceptable to you especially if you're coming from parents who are immigrants right they are going to have a certain kind of money temperature set as well anytime there's sacrifice involved in your family heritage anytime there's like you know having to go through poverty or pull yourself up out of challenging circumstances all of that informs our relationship to money and wealth. And so a lot of times, that's why you hear about lottery winners or you know NBA players or football players who get all this money in their 20s and then it's gone by the time they're 30. It's because they've never readjusted their temperature around their relationship to money. They, and, they, and there's also that sense of like, I won't have my people if I become rich, the people who have been with me on this journey, uh, they might leave me, they might abandon me, they might be jealous of me, they might be threatened by me. Now, this is not being consciously thought, it's unconsciously felt. Uh, it's called tall poppy syndrome in Australia, where as soon as you get a little taller than everybody else, the culture is going to cut you down. It's a little bit here in Hawaii too. The very famous hat here and t-shirt is stay humble and pray. So what does that imply? That implies you get a little too confident in yourself. We're going to cut you down, right? And that can happen if you're coming from poor or middle-class backgrounds, it's going to be even harder for you to be able to transcend to the next level if you don't do some work around what your relationship to money is. Um, and where does it stand right now? What does success mean for you? You have to figure out not what it means to Joe Smith next to you, not what it means to the guy you're listening to on TV or this podcast, right? You have to find it out for yourself. What I looks, what success means to me is going to be very, very different what it looks like for you. And it, you have to be sure that when you get success, like what is the success for you? So you can, you know, be striving towards that and not somebody else's made up version of it. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, thanks for summing that all up. I want to go over that a few times as well when we get when we put this up. Um, great. Okay. So now uh, with, with podcasting, what's, which is your yeah. favorite podcast? Like with uh, the individual podcast, like a steady trade. I say that yeah. because I remember Tim Bowen saying um, his favorite podcast is the one with JJ talking about uh, the market maker yeah kind of stuff yeah. with, with GME and uh, GameStop and all that. That was a really, that, I think that's one of my favorites too. Yeah, but, um, I, I, think that is, is yours. I think that is. I, I mean, I'm probably going to say episode 100, which is when they invited me on the first time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> because that's when I first got to meet the both of them. And they both were so much fun in that episode. You know, we had never met before. Uh, and we just, they just were very curious about what it was that I did. So I got to talk about something I love. Uh, so that, that's probably my favorite episode. Pretty close to that, though, is I think all the wonderful traders we've had on. JJ, uh, we've had Ray from Confessions of a Market Maker. Uh, and JJ, of course, is from Confessions of a Market Maker, too. We've had Brian Lee on. We've had Jack Kellogg on. We had Mariana on. Uh, we had a, I did a women's episode with all women traders. That was unbelievable, uh, where it was just like, lots of women just talking about like how they trade is just it's just different than the way men trade sometimes so like there there is a different approach we're just built differently men and women um yeah so i'd say all the traders who have gone to hell and and and, and come back you know and talk about their pain those that are where they're very vulnerable those are my favorite episodes when people are honest about the challenges they face 
Yeah, I like all of those as well. Um, yeah. One that I, I know it's not in part, I, I follow Jack's journey a lot, Jack Kellogg's, and like he, yeah. he has a whole series, I don't know if you've seen it, with Tim, Tim Sykes, um, I haven't going seen through that. his whole journey, like in three parts, it's like three or four hours all together, and he goes Beautiful. through like all the individual like pain and the whole yeah. journey, you know, it's really... Yeah he puts himself out there and uh yeah. i think he's really aware of like all i mean to be a, a trader at a high level you got to be conscious and aware of yourself yeah. and and like yeah i think yeah uh that's what makes me so so in, in inspired by this community is that the traders who are so honest about the challenges they face that is so inspiring because the people everybody's going to have a challenge and to be not to feel like, wow, I'm not alone in this challenge. There are others before me who have been able to transcend these challenges. You know, that, that is pretty powerful. And, and I think those traders that do speak honestly and authentically, they have, they, they are the cream of the crop. So if you're looking for traders to inspire you and encourage you, look for the ones that are brutally honest about their journey, because they are the ones who are being these straight shooters with you, you know? Absolutely. Um, I know for me, uh, it helped out a lot to go through the journey, especially in the beginning, the first couple of years is rough. Yeah. So yeah. to know yeah. that someone went through that and that's, yes. that's part of the journey. It just, it's really, really, it's, it's inspiring, you know, and it's, it's great that these successful traders put themselves out there, uh, explain the whole journey, brutally honest, like you say, you know, yeah. so yeah. it's just great for it's just great to be in a community like that, you know, even I though it's, it's all virtual and online, but it's, it's yeah. just as, it's the same as being in person. It pretty is, much. it is. And the, and the love and support encouragement. And, you know, you just watch some of the great guys and how much they give back to people and how much they answer questions on social media. And how every, the, I think that's the most important piece I want people to get is that, it's a big pie, people. Like you can, like their success. They know that their success. That they can still help other people succeed. It's not like a, a zero sum game, which I think some people do believe. Right? No, you can still help others and still find your edge. You know. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so with that, um, when do you plan on doing another book? Uh, actually, I'm working on one right now called The Resilient Trader. Uh, the Resilient Trader. Wow. Mm -hmm. I like the title. I like the title. I, I just um, finished Tim Grover's book, I think, which is, oh. was it Relentless? Or it's, it's another one. He has two of them. Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't know that one. Tim, you know Tim Grover though, right? I don't know him. Yeah. So he, he was Michael Jordan's um, trainer. Oh, and Wow. So he he uh he trained Jordan through I think six championships and then Jordan gave him permission because he, he was specifically for Jordan. So he, yeah. Jordan gave him permission when he retired to train Kobe, and then wow. and, and then he also trained Dwayne Wade. So he trained Kobe for five championships, Dwayne Wade for two championships, and wow. Jordan for six. So six plus wow. five, 11, I think thirteen championships. Yes, he has. he has thirteen rings. Wow, that is and, amazing. Um, yeah. So, and uh, he has two books. One is called, oh, the new one I think is Winning. Yeah. Wow. Winning. And oh, Relentless. Check it out. And Relentless. Relentless. And Relentless is like, well, the title itself is, is similar qualities to Resilient. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, yeah for um, sure. I think that's ultimately what traders you have to be. If you're not resilient and relentless, it, that's that's probably should be the title. Relentless and resilient, and resilient yeah. right? Because yeah. you have to be both as a trader. And, and what I will do is a plug, if I may, for uh, my course called Trading EQ, Stocks to Trade is selling it now. Uh, and it's a two and a half hour course on, you know, fear of missing out and how to combat that, how to not, you know, be revenge trading. So I talk about a lot of the emotional side of trading and give you tools and tips in that course and stocks trade sells it. Now I think it's selling for $299. So that's something that, you know, I'd love to see traders if they're, if they can't afford coaching yet, or they're still beginners, it's a minimal investment to get, you know, some juice about the places you might, a lot of potholes that you could ultimately fall into. Uh huh. So you're saying, okay, so with stocks to trade, that's um, 
how how does that work? It's like a, a weekly thing, or it's a uh, no, videos? it's two and a, it's a it's an online video course. It's two and a half hours long. So you would you would go to my Instagram or Twitter handle and click on the link, and then it'll take you to the shopping cart for stocks to trade. Where the course they'll they'll send it to you electronically. Yeah, they've been uh really stocks to trade has really come a long way since from when I I think I, I started I used it a, like four years ago. Wow. It was like a beta mode and now it's like taking wow. off. It has like all these bells and whistles. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. And yeah. you have uh, the webinars from Tim Bowen and Steven yep. in there. And now they got coaching in there. And yeah, yeah. Oh, I just did a webinar a couple of weeks ago and I'll be doing another one uh, for the pro room in a couple of weeks. And I also do, uh, I host a couple of webinars, uh, every month for true trader job net, which is another great trading company. So yeah. great. Well, yeah. Kim, thank you so much for doing this with me and taking the time out. You're, you're so generous. And like, I just love all your stuff. You know, you're, you're like the, Thanks, the calm mind in the middle of all this craziness in the trading world. And, uh, you bring a, you, like I said before, you bring that perspective, uh, a psychological perspective, conscious perspective into the whole steady trade thing, which I, that's why I love listening to that podcast. Oh, and, and yours. You. Oh, I, and um, I forgot to mention my briefly, my favorite one with yours, you had Matthew McConaughey on. I remember yes. that one. Yeah, yes. that was great. That, that probably is my favorite podcast oh, on my yeah. own podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> I was blown away that he agreed, which I thought was very gracious of him. I mean, you know, I, I hope everybody listening here will join and subscribe to my podcast. But my podcast huh. is, is kind of small for Matthew McConaughey, but he was very gracious and humble to come on, which I'm flattered that he did. Uh, but he didn't come on because I have thousands of subscribers yet. Yeah, and <laughs> but I, he yeah. just... I You're, think he really just was a decent person because my invite was very uh, sincere and I, I wanted him on because I felt men need to have a role model. They don't have enough role models who are masculine role models who are advocating self-development and self-awareness uh, and to be self-reflective. And that is what I felt his book green lights. He, and, it, and in his life he's doing. And I thought, you know, because most of my audience is men, I wanted them to see this masculine role model who is advocating self-awareness and self-development. And that book is very powerful journey into how he constantly keeps himself real and not to get caught up in the, you know, la 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 of Hollywood, which is just like a trader. You can get caught up in the market and your uh -huh. own success. How do you keep it real? And his journey to keep it real for himself, I thought a lot of traders could relate to. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a big fan of McConaughey and big fan of your podcast too. You, you just started yours recently, I think. Well, not recently, yes. but it's yeah. not... Well, I, we started over uh, probably a year and a half ago, and then we I took a pause, and we just came back strong, hopefully, in the last six months. So, uh -huh. yeah, we have about 500 subscribers. So, you know, look, I'm happy that anybody's listening. If you're listening, David, I'm happy, yeah. and you find it's a contribution to you. I, you know, I, tr I it's easy in this social media world to get caught up with the numbers and how many viewers and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I try to always get myself back to center and be like, go back to that famous quote that says, if you have just assisted one life in breathing a little bit easier, that is to have succeeded. So I don't have to have 5 million listeners. If I have one listener who feels like there's something in what I've said that helps them, I mean, that's enough. Yeah, we're on the same page with that, you know, so as that's what I, I'm, I'm going for something like that as well. So good. Absolutely. Good. Well, well, that alone is going to set you apart, David. So I wish you lots of success with yours as you're just beginning. And I'm excited to see where you will go because you have a good heart and you care and that and you have an independent mind you think for yourself, which is rare. So good Thank job you. you. Thank yeah. you, Kim. Um, yeah. Great. So uh, we're gonna. So I'm gonna put all the stuff in the notes, uh, okay. and yeah, the viewers can, the listeners can go and check that out. And once Perfect. again, thanks, Kim. Um, and hopefully, we'll keep in contact. And Absolutely. yeah, I can't wait to read your new book when it Thank comes you. out. Thank you. Thanks I'll a lot, Kim. Know. Thank you. Aloha. Bye. Bye.